Okay, last time we talked about Noah and his flood and the timelines with the Zadok calendar and how it just did not work a couple different ways. So today we're going to look at the same story, Noah and his 150 day timeline, but with the lunar calendar. So it's going to be a little bit different, but kind of about the same. And this time we're just going to do a little comparison very briefly of three different lunar calendar counts. The... Um, Sidereal month, the moon month, a sidereal month or a tropical month where the actual moon cycle is 27.3 days, I think. And then we're going to look at the synodic month, which is the popular 29 and a half day month. And then we'll be doing a little comparison on the calculated Hebrew calendar and see if they can come up with 150 days to that 17th day of the seventh month that is written so clearly in the flight account. And it's about 58 slides, really short. But uh, anyway, Tim's going to bring it up. I'm sorry. Enjoy it. Okay, Shabbat Shalom. Let's go and look at Noah. Noah, Yahuwah's chosen co-captain. And we're going to be having a lunar view of the flood today. Let's have a look and see what happens. And the pertinent question is, was Noah's Ark commanded to have a periscope? Very strange question, I know. But there's a reason why we're asking this. Which calendar appointed Noah's Ark? It was an appointed time, very specified. Who was the captain proper of Noah's Ark? And was Noah in charge of Ark navigation? Was that he was he was commissioned to do? Or was Noah's commission specifically to care for the animals within the Ark? And ultimately, who was in charge of charting the Ark's voyage throughout the raging waters? Will this episode of turbulence on the earth Expose the true calendar of El Shaddai? Which commander was guiding the ark? Yahuwah Elohim was the guiding commander of the ark. In Genesis 8, 1 we read, And Elohim remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And Elohim made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. We will be charting out flood time frames as recorded in the scriptures while focusing on the lunar calendar aspect of it all. Let's look at the timeline from start to finish of this watery trial for Noah and his progeny. Highly accurate details were recorded for our understanding. Yes, we need to know them. A solar plane or a lunar-oriented calendar? That's what we're questioning today. Will the lunar system of determining time find alignment with Scripture's documentation of the flood account? Let's examine Noah's flood through a lunar calendar perspective. Will it find scriptural alignment with each and every statute and recorded word with every statute? That's the question, and that is the important point. The number of cycles in a month will strongly come into play in this study. The calendar of the covenant, which was blood ratified at Mount Sinai, achieves perfect alignment with every word of the scripture. So the appropriate question is, will the lunar aspect be able to match or exceed that lofty height? Or is there a precipice waiting for the lunar system? Yeah, it's time to get both feet wet. We will start by revealing the flood through the covenant understanding first. Then an examination of the lunar vision will follow. Noah's shadow-oriented flood experience. The teshuva, that's the day of the shadow and the vernal equinox. The teshuva initiates the start of the new year. My scriptural explanation 
the shadow happens and the very next day is the new year. We see that uh, displayed in Exodus 12 verses 1 and 2. So here in the first month, there's 30 24-hour cycles. Methuselah had died. That's Enoch's son. On the 10th cycle of the second month, that's seven cycles before the flood, and we read about this in Genesis 1-7. Here's the verse. For after seven more days, I am sending rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and shall wipe from the face of the earth all that stand that I created. Yahuwah said, and 40 nights. Are they to be counted? Well, these 40 nights will carry the count through until dawn. They will carry complete full 24-hour cycles, and this will establish a proper count, very important, and 40 nights. Noah's shadow-oriented flood experience. So we're looking at the 17th here. That's after those seven days we just read about. Genesis 7, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of the heavens were opened. The 17th. To the point where the flood begins, we see a total of 47 cycles thus far. Noah's Shane flood experience. Shane is first seen in Genesis 1. It, the meaning of it is year. On the 17th cycle, the, the second month, the deluge commenced. Genesis 7 verse 1. There were 14 cycles of rain. Yes, we need to start counting on the 17th. There were 14 cycles of rain to the end of the second month. The rain ended on the 26th cycle of the third month. The torrential downpour ended after 40 days and 40 nights had been completed. There's the verse, Genesis 7, verse 12. It has, and 40 nights. We must count those 40 nights also. From the dawn on the 27th, there was no more rain. The 26th had been completed. Noah faithfully numbers the cycles. We are taught in Psalms 90 verse 12, teach us to number our days to bring our hearts unto wisdom. Was Noah doing that? Was he numbering the cycles or was he looking to a moon? We continue examining the timeline of 150 cycles of flood water covering the earth. Months 4, 5, and 6 occur, occur, and they are 30 days each. There has now accumulated 134 cycles since the waters began on the earth. The 17th of the second month to the end of the sixth month. Torah has established all that is required. We do not need to go outside of Torah to find information on Noah's flood. Let's secure some scriptural context before sailing into the miraculous water events of the seventh month. Genesis 8.3 And the waters receded steadily from the earth, and at the end, note the word end emphasis there, at the end of the 150 days the waters diminished. Shall we recall the Genesis 1 creation account? The end of each cycle at creation arrived, timed with the boker, that's the ox and the plow. That boker is the start, <coughs> excuse me, the start of the ensuing sequential cycle. That's the pattern. And we'll carry that pattern through as a seed into the flood account attention here with the former slides thought in mind after which recorded point had the waters allowed the ark to rest on solid ground genesis 8 3 
And yes, you'll probably see this verse a number of times. And the waters receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of the 150 days, the waters diminished. Are we safe to understand it was dawn of the 151st cycle of the flood activity? when the ark was recorded to rest on the mountains of Ararat? Was it the 151st cycle? Scripture's instruction, Isaiah 8, 20, to the Torah and to the witness, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no daybreak. Interesting, that word is shahar, and it references the light of dawn, light, a spiritual light. If they're not speaking according to the Torah, there is no spiritual light. So let's search the Torah for the intercalating lunar timelines, if they exist. Teach us to number our days, to bring our hearts into wisdom. We need to remember that at all times. The two speeds of the water. This is an interesting concept. Did the waters change speed? Well, let's look what the Torah says. Genesis 8, 3, and the waters receded steadily. That's the gradual progression of the waters withdrawing. And at the end of the 150 days, the waters diminished. It's a different Hebrew word. We're going to be looking at that. At the end of the 150 days, the waters rapidly withdrew, providing one accessible mountaintop. Why do we understand one accessible mountaintop? Well, go to Genesis 8.5 for more clarification, and you'll see on the, I believe it was the 10th month that the waters receded. You can see the mountaintops, the remaining mountaintops. So the waters were diminished specifically so the ark could land on Mount Ararat. Let's look at those two words. The two speeds of the water. You'll see here, the first word describing it is shub. And the second word over here describing this, the second speed of the water is chaser. And I got this line underneath the C and the H so we can understand the guttural sound of the chet letter. Let's read this, what the, the verse says, the waters were returning off the earth, going and returning, and at the end of the 150 days, the waters were abating. That's from the interlinear scripture analyzer. The two words, shub and chaser. So what's this leading into? Is it possible Yahuwah specifically purposed a second month start to the flood? Is it possible that Yahuwah allowed Methuselah to sleep in the first month, forming a situation where Noah would need to handle the dead body, preventing Noah from observing the Abib 14 appointed time? Was this purposed? Have you noted that Noah would have observed the provisional second month set apart appointment for Passover in the ark? Provisional. Why is that emphasized? Because there's two specific reasons for a second Passover. One is if you had to bury a dead body, and the other is if you were traveling and you could not comfortably observe Passover. That's why it's a provisional second month set apart appointment for Passover. What about Noah? Well, it was a double appointment. What was the, the second appointment? The command. Noah, enter the ark was the command. <clears throat> that was an appointment for Noah. In Torah, the Tanakh, or the life of Yahusha, do we find any mention for determining worship appointments by the phases of the moon? any phase whatsoever? Do we find any instance at all of mention of that? That's the question. Will Noah sink the lunar calendars? Genesis 8.3 indicates to us that the waters were on the earth for 150 days. 
from the 17th day of the second month up until the last day of the sixth month, there were 134 days of water on the earth. The question here, how many more days of the seventh month are needed to achieve the full 150 days of water on the earth? Well, from Scripture, we need 16 days in the seventh month to achieve the 150 days of destructive water on the earth. 16 more days in the seventh month. Does this mean the ark rested on the 16th cycle of the seventh month? Exactly what event is it that the scriptures records as occurring on the 16th cycle of the seventh month? Where is our lifeline? Where should we be looking? Well, the Torah, of course. That's where all information worthwhile is, is stored. The 16th is not mentioned. Did not the ark settle on the 17th of the month? Genesis says in verses 8 and 4, or chapter 8, verse 4, I should say, and in the seventh month, the seventeenth day of the month, the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat, not the sixteenth. So why was the sixteenth question? Attention. The sixteenth cycle had to accomplish twenty-four hours, tallied at dawn of the seventeenth, exactly as the Genesis 1 format, to be accounted as full and complete. It says at the end of the 150, we need to pay attention then to that. Yahuwah had paced the waters. Attention here again. This next portion will point out very explicitly to the high caliber of Yahuwah's accuracy within his covenant calendar. 24 hours on the 16th of the seventh month completed the 150th cycle timeline as recorded by Moshe. It was sometime after dawn of the 17th that the ark scored a touchdown, if you will, solid ground. I believe uh, Noah was pretty happy about that. Would the lunar ark have needed an arcoscope? Was this the first periscope? And I say, watch for it. Strange question. Yes, I agree. Yahuwah, the ultimate choreographer. This is a scriptural description of circumstances nearing the 150th day on the seventh month. Verses Genesis 8.3. And the waters receded steadily from the earth. That word again is H7725, Shub. The waters on the earth were gradually and consistently decreasing from the surface of the earth. Shub describes the physical condition over many weeks. Let's now look at Genesis 8.3 and see if you are able to detect a direct and intentional change in Yahuwah's action with design to ground the ark, allow for it to settle. Yahuwah's design. Again, we see this verse. And the waters receded steadily from the earth, and at the end of the 150 days, the waters, well, we'll continue with that. The word end, that is, maquettes, from the end of. Let's have a look at this word. We're going to look at uh, Jesenius' lexicon. Note the pink underlines. End. Extremity. That's an interesting word. At the extremity of something. In the extremity on the bank, in the margin of the rivers in Egypt, the extremity, that's on the bank that is not in the river, at the very end, at the very final point of something. At the end of three days, after three days, that defines a point of cutoff, the whole sum 
can it be whole if it's not at the very end of something? The whole and the sum, the whole number, the end. That's what this word maquettes has for us. So if we were to cut off the 150 days before they were completed, we would not be doing what the Hebrew instruction declares, the end. Very, very important. Yahuwah, the ultimate choreographer, number two. And at the end of the 150 days, the waters diminished. What about this word diminished? The scriptures declare in writing that at the end of the 150 days, not before and not during the 150 days, but at the end, the waters diminished. What is special about this word? Well, the word is chaser. The definitions show Yahuwah's concerted effort with an intentional purpose to withdraw the waters rapidly. That intentional purpose was to allow the ark to touch stable ground. Yahuwah very specifically made provision for the day after the 150 days of water on the earth to allow the ark to rest on hard ground. We're going to look at this word, chaser. You see it right up here? Chaser. Again, Jesenius has a lexicon that's in good and it's interesting. To be devoid of anything. To lack. To be without. There are some definitions. To be lessened. That would ap apply to this water. To be lessened. Chet samach resh is the root word. And upon examining other lexicons as well, it becomes quite clear that after the 150th cycle finalized, Yahuwah made a concerted effort and removed the water rapidly, intending for the ark to settle. Noah floats into the seventh month. Let's have a look. There we see in the red arrow, 40 days and 40 nights of rain into the near the end of the third month. And the waters receded steadily from the earth. That's Shub. That's the slower illustration up until the 16th. They're close to it. Yahuwah's precision examined and the waters receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of the 150 days, the waters diminished. Emphasis and repetition, absolutely. This needs to be understood clearly. Chaser, to diminish, to cut short, to be devoid of anything, to lack and to be without. A very purposed word. Yahuwah's concerted effort. When? Well, let's get this right. The end of the 150 days, not nearing the end, not close to the end, but at the end, the waters fulfilled the complete 150 days on the earth. The whose accuracy is paramount. Noah's Psalms 90 verse 12. Teach us to count. Teach us to number our days is what it says. After the 150 days, the 17th day of the seventh month, the waters diminished, chaser, there was a concerted effort for an intentional purpose on that 17th day for the ark to land. For those that require a simple equation, here it is, 14 days of the second month. Then we add up the 30, 30, 30, and 30 of the four, of the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth month. And the 16th days, adds up to the 150 days of water on the earth. That brings us to the seventh month. Please remember that the 150th day must land on the 16th day of the seventh month to allow for the precise effort of the waters rapidly diminishing, permitting the ark to rest exactly on the 17th of the seventh month as is written in scripture.
Now it begins to get ultra interesting. Does the lunar art calendar, sorry, does the lunar calendar have a better solution? Let's have a look. Confirming the scriptural documentation first. By strict 30 cycle months, reflecting all prophetic timelines, the 150 days of destructive water on the earth ended on the 16th of the seventh month. The 16th cycle ended at dawn's light of the 17th Oker, or dawn. The waters then reduced rapidly, Chaser, allowing the ark to rest on the solid mountains of Ararat on the 17th cycle of the month, Genesis 8, 3, and 4. There we see in the orange bar, that's the 17th cycle. That is where the 150 cycles had ended at dawn of the 17th. As of the 17th of the month, the heavy waters no longer destroyed the earth. Yahuwah determined a completed circuit in Ecclesiastes 1 to 5. The sun also rises and the sun sets and hurries back to the place where it arose. That's 360 degrees, no more and no less. That's Yahuwah's definition of a completed circuit. The monthly circuit of the moon is now approximately 27.32 cycles. That's the moon, the moon circuit in position to the Matsaroth. This is called a tropical or a sidereal or a sidereal, however you want to say it, a sidereal month. The metonic or synodic lunar month used by Judah from phase to phase is purposely extended to go beyond Yahuwah's designated 360-degree circuit to approximately 29.5 cycles. That's uh, over two cycles more than this sidereal month, or two, two days more, if you don't understand cycles. We will first look at Noah's flood through the 27.32 lunar month cycle. No. It will not be rounded off to 28, for that is not what happens in reality in the heavens. Then we're going to look at the 29.5 cycle month that will follow. The question, was Noah tracking with the moon? Was Noah tracking the tropical moon? If you look down here below this arrow, you'll see 27.3 on each of these months. This is representing the lunar moons. For the rain to start on the 17th of the second moon, it would need to start on the 44.3 cycle of the year. See that down here, the 17th day of the second month, 44.3. This is what we're, we're looking at today. From the 17th of the second moon to the final cycle of the sixth moon would tally at 120.5 cycles. Let's add them up. 11.3 plus 27.3 and we continue on through the months. Add them up comes to 120.5 at the end of the sixth moon. That leaves 29.5 more cycles required in month number seven. That should raise a red flag right there to fulfill the scriptures documented 150 cycles of turbulent water on the earth. 120.5 plus 29.5 equals 150. On the tropical 27.3 cycle lunar calendar, the ark would need to sail 29.5 full cycles well into the eighth tropical month. Already, that takes us away from Torah. And this would be needed to accomplish the 150 cycles of water on the earth before the ark touched down. Again, what is that going to look like? 27.3 cycles in this month. The tropical seventh moon, flotation exposure. So we're looking at the seventh moon this time. 
On the bottom left-hand side, in the red bar, we see this is the end of the sixth moon, and it's at 120.5 cycles thus far. Here we see the first cycle of the seventh moon in the orange bar. This is according to scripture, the 16th in the seventh month. The, it's the 150th and final cycle where water, chaser, is rapidly and sufficiently removed for the ark. Genesis 8, 4, the 17th, the 151st cycle, Noah's Ark settled down onto hard ground of Ararat. Now the question. Did Noah touch down on Mount Ararat, then lift up again, realizing that the 150 cycles of torrential water was not complete until the eighth tropical moon? Into moon eight to complete the 150 cycles of water? Is that what we need did noah actually touch down in the eighth lunar month month maybe <laughs> let's have a look the first of the seventh month on is on the h or on the or on the orange bar right here if noah had settled down onto hard ground on the 17th of the seventh tropical month the waters would have would not yet have air diminished sufficiently to allow this. So what arc modifications would Noah have needed to construct while sailing to achieve this feat? Well, it might seem a little bit humorous, but really it's not. Because this leads us away from Torah. There is no linear alignment, and that is serious. Into moon 8 for 2.2 more cycles to fulfill the 8 cycles of heavy rain? No, this doesn't align with Torah. Did Noah actually touch down in the 8th lunar month? The 8th tropical moon application failure. We know in this green box here we see the 8th moon. Can you agree to the lunar arc completing the 150 cycles of turbulent water on the second cycle of the eighth moon? Scripture declares the ark landed on the 17th of the seventh month. The month is a Chodesh. It's not a Yerach. The Yerach is the lunar month. Is there a start calendar kerfuffle here? Absolutely. Okay. Then maybe Noah was looking at the metonic cycle. Is that what he tracked while floating in the ark? The metonic cycle? Let's have a look. First, what is the metonic cycle? The metonic cycle, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce that word. Well, maybe I will. And it indeed an idiocuterus or something like that from ancient Greek. Maria will do very well with that, but I won't. <laughs> and mean it is 19. Is a period of almost exactly 19 years after which the lunar phases reoccur at the same time of the year. The recurrence is not perfect. I could stop right there. I could just shut this study off right there and we'd have it solved. The recurrence is not perfect. So the question comes, is Yahuwah perfect? Or is he flawed? If something is established or declared to be established that is not perfect, where does that leave your creator? Let's continue. The recurrence is not perfect. And by precise observation, the metonic cycle defined as 235 synodic months is just two hours, four minutes, and 58 seconds longer than 19 tropical years. Metan of Athens in the 5th century BC judged the cycle to be a whole number of days, 6,940. Using the whole numbers facilitates the construction of a lunar lunisolar calendar. 
A tropical year is longer than 12 lunar months and shorter than 13 of them. In a Metonic calendar, seven months are added. Uh oh, there's another large red flag added intercalation. In a Metonic calendar, seven months are added over a cycle of 19 years to make up the necessary 235, that is, 19 by 12 plus 7 equals 235. And this is a quote from information on the Metonic cycle. I did not write this. This is quoted from their information source. A Hebrew, note the quotation marks, a Hebrew lunar calendar. In the Babylonian and Hebrew lunisolar calendars, the years 3, 6, 8, 11, 14, 17, and 19 are the long, as in the 13th month years of the Metonic cycle. This cycle forms the basis of the Greek and Hebrew calendars. A 19-year cycle is used for the computation of the date of Easter each year. Another red flag. Computation date for Easter. Why is that not found in Scripture? So the question here, which Hebrew might that be? Hebrew believers in Yahusha and Torah? Or Jews who crucified him? We cannot forget the two types living in Judea. Scripture reveals spiritual Hebrews that believe Torah and Jews that did and do not. Was Noah tracking the Metonic moon? For the rain to start on the 17th of the second month, it would need to start on cycle 46.5 of the year. Point five. Did the rain start at sunset or dawn? From the 17th of the second month to the final cycle of the sixth month, this would tally at 130.5 cycles of tempestuous water. On the Metonic cycle, that's the 29.5 lunar calendar, after the sixth month, the ark would need to sail Watch this, 19.5 more cycles in the seventh moon to fulfill scriptures recorded 150 cycles of water on the earth. Well, let's add them up. If you look down here, from the 17th, where the water started on the second month, there's 12.5 cycles to the end of that month. So we add them up here, 12.5 plus 29.5, four times. We come to the end of the sixth month, that's 130.5 cycles right here at the end of the sixth month. So what's the seventh month going to look like now? A seventh month micrometonic introspection. On the left, bottom here, it's the end of the metonic month on this black bar. It's 135.5 cycles. Next is the first day of the seventh month in the orange bar. Over here, we're citing scripture. Scripture says on the 17th, the 151st cycle, the water was chaser, reduced rapidly to facilitate the ark's resting point. But the metonic 150 cycles of extreme water had not yet been fulfilled. Here we are looking at the end of the 150 cycles of torrential water according to the Metonic cycle. This, blue, this pink bar shows us where it ends. This orange bar is where Yahuwah said the water had, had re reduced rapidly. So the question here, did Noah's Ark sink down, resting on the mountaintop 2.5 cycles before the water was intentionally reduced for this highly specific purpose? Think about this. 
there's something not right with the lunar system aligning with Torah. Is there a problem? Well, the 17th, the Metonic Ark, settles down on hard ground. Is that correct? Is that what we see? Is it a sub-arc marine? Attention, Noah. Use tall arcoscope for a 29.5 cycle metonic moon sinking. Yeah, a little bit of humor, but it's not very good because this exposes out of alignment with the scripture. Something is not right with the metonic system. Did the metonic arc have a leaky periscope problem, causing it to rise up and complete the 150 cycles of heavy water while sailing above it? Did it touch down on the 17th and then rise up to complete the 150 days? No. Something's not right here. There's a problem. Well, there's also a third option. Let's look at the lunar Hebrew calendar to consider this one. Yes, we can easily agree that the ark did not settle down in the deep water two cycles early and that it did not need a periscope. That is not really the issue. Maybe Noah needed some preparations to be done in that interim two cycles. Yet the big question is, are you willing to ignore the lunar calendar's glaring failure to align with an accurate linear fashion to scriptures? Is that actually acceptable? It could possibly be temporarily acceptable until a perfectly accurate account is provided. Will the third lunar option, the so acclaimed Hebrew calendar, make any improvement? Towards linear scriptural accuracy? What is this Hebrew calendar? We will now view the acclaimed Hebrew calendar. Yes, time to get both feet wet. Again, let's dive in. This is the counted or calculated Hebrew lunar calendar. If you look at the months here, they calculate this with a 30, 29, 30, 29, 30, 29 type format. Interestingly, this calendar, oh, too fast. This calendar does arrive to the correct common era 30 of the crucifixion, but does it line up with another portion of Torah? Remember, everything has to line up. If one identity is out of position, then there's a severe problem. Does this line up with Noah? Was Noah on this calendar? The Ark, lunar drifting. We have just viewed the Hebrew calendar, or the acclaimed Hebrew calendar. This is a pagan lunar calendar promoted as the scriptural calendar. Let's see how it rates. We will begin by plugging in the number of days seen in each month. The first month does not count, but the second month begins the count with 29 days. So let's add them up. There we see the rain begins on the 17th of the second moon. There's, you see that pink arrow has the days to the end of the second month. Can we agree that when the rain is recorded as starting on the 17th, we then need to count it as the first cycle of rain, just like in the 27.3 day month. And as a side thought, then what about creation's first day? Why is it that people do not count, or some people do not count that first day? Just a side thought, something to think about. Yes, we're going to count the 17th, the first day of rain. Was Noah lunar drifting? The rain began on the 17th cycle and continued through the 29th of the second month. 17 to 29 is 13 cycles of rain. The drifting continued. Let's keep adding up the remaining months. 13 plus 30 plus 29 plus 30 plus 29. 
that he comes to 131 days to the end of the sixth month. That's your 29, 30, or 30, 29, 30, 29 pattern. All added up. Was this what Noah was doing? The scripture tells us the ark landed on the 17th of the seventh month, Genesis 8, 4. Here, with this system, we now have 131 lunar-based days at the end of the sixth month. In the seventh month, this Hebrew calendar, so-called Hebrew calendar, will now require 19 more days to fulfill the 150 days of water on the earth. Lunar drifting, seventh month alignment problem. There is marked out the 17th day of the seventh month of Ethanine. Over here, the moons, two to six, adds up to 131 days at this point. Again, at the end of the 150 days, the waters diminished. To complete the full 150 lunar-based days, the 19th day of the seventh month of Ethany must be achieved. This gold bar represents where the end of the 150 days would need to be for this calculated lunar problem or calendar. Why the scriptures say this is where the 17th day where the ark settled down, yet the 150 days on the calculated lunar calendar is over here on the 19th. Is there a periscope problem for the ark? Or is there a linear alignment problem with, Cor with Torah? Was this lunar ark on another voyage? Yahuwah did not withdraw the waters in a substantial way until the end of the 150 days, that being the 19th of Ethanim. Is that what scripture says? I thought scripture wrote that the ark, the ark touched down on the 17th. Why is it this calendar declares the end of the 150 is on the 19th? Again, a severe problem for the ark. That 19th does not align with Scripture. The Scriptures declare the end of the 150 days here on the 16th, and the ark would touch down on the 17th. The lunar ark floated past Yahuwah's appointed mountain. Is there a need to say more? Yahuwah declares that Noah's Ark rested upon the mountain on the 17th of the seventh month, Ethanim. Yahuwah's appointed mountain for you today. Will your navigator successfully anchor you on Yahuwah's appointed mountain today? Or by choosing a lunar phase over Yahuwah's command to number your cycles Will your ark pass it by? Seventh month, lunar month drifting. Another lunar-based problem. If indeed the lunar ark rested on the 17th day of Ethanim, the seventh month, then the 150 days of water on the earth was not fulfilled according to documentation. If indeed Noah was sailing according to a lunar-based guide, was he then drifting off Yahuwah's course, both physically and spiritually? And would that apply to us today? Set before you are three lunar-based choices. Three choices have serious scriptural alignment problems that cannot be overcome and still stay within the Torah guidelines. These three lunar choices can be discarded permanently. Only one system aligns perfectly with the scriptural documentation. For myself, I choose the calendar of Covenant Torah. It is blood ratified and aligns perfectly with the scriptures starting with Genesis 1 
Hebrew Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moshe, Joshua, Samuel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and the list goes on. This covenant calendar exposes with brilliant clarity the details of Yahusha living out the Torah. Word for word, no detail left untouched. Are we listening to his sandals? May Yahuwah bless you always, giving you wisdom overflowing. If you require assistance with this information, please send your questions to me, Timothy Asselford, at questions at studythecalendar.com. And I thank you for your time. I know your time is precious. And I say Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, team. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Pretty clear. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Just about uh, That's all, right? Just about counting. Mm -hmm. You just uh, have uh, our days. Yes. Uh, unless... Um, People believe that the, at Noah's time, the, the moon cycle was 30 days. And um, so that would solve their problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That, excuse me, that would solve the problem maybe back then, but that would not solve our problem today. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> nope. And I, I'm not living on the earth, so... <laughs> uh, Tim, can you please um, repeat uh, your point about the second Passover, Mathusala's um, uh, death and um, not keeping the second uh, Passover? I think I missed that. It's provisional. There's two, mm, I remember. two provisions that you are allowed to keep a second Passover mm -hmm. in the second month. The one is if you, if you have to touch a dead body for some reason, if you're in contact with a dead body, you have to bury it, prepare it, whatever, that that uh, qualifies you to, ha to observe Passover in the second month. Or if you are traveling for some unavoidable reason that you cannot be at home in a comfortable place prepared properly, for Passover. That's the second qualification. That's the only two qualifications you see in Scripture for a second appointment or a second observation of Passover. So you're saying that uh, because Methuselah died in the first, the first month of that year, of the flood, Noah had to bury him. Mm -hmm. So yes. he would keep the second Passover on the 14th of the second month. Yes. The High Shabbat would be the 15th. And then on the 16th, the flood would start. I do not believe there was a feast of unleavened bread. It's, the scripture says nothing about a feast of unleavened bread in the second month. The only mention is Passover. That's it. Ah, uh -huh. mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Still, though, it didn't start on the 15th of the second month. It started on the 16th of the, the second month. The 17th. 17th. 17th, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. Yeah. 17th. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you believe that Noah was keeping Passover even before Exodus? When, when you look at the feasts and you study them, the scripture says, in the, it mentions the feast and it says, in their appointed time. Mm -hmm. So the there is a specific appointed time for that festival. And when, when you do not, okay, the, the Passover proper did not happen until Mitzrayim or Egypt. That's when the first proper observation, I guess I, my terminology isn't correct. That doesn't mean that the appointed time did not exist. That Abib 14 appointed time existed. Well, I say that it was seated from Zion, from heaven. It was seated mm -hmm. onto this earth. So that appointed time existed all throughout. And I believe all the appointed times existed. They were appointed onto this earth 
at the very beginning. And the application of observation came came as this earth progressed. That's that's how I understand it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people can uh, people want to abolish Passover and they want to abolish unleavened bread and they want to abolish all the feasts. Go ahead, abolish them. But the the appointed dates are still there. Mm -hmm. And those apply no matter who wants to abolish the feasts. You cannot abolish those appointed dates either. Mm -hmm. They are seeded from Theon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From the foundation of the world, yeah. yeah. And, and let's not forget, too, that there was sin in heaven. There was rebellion in heaven before there was sin on earth. And then definitely when Adam and Eve uh, sinned there at the garden, um, to me, that was where that first lamb was laid down, that first sacrificial lamb. That was the lamb that pat the blood of that lamb passed over them so that they did not come under that death penalty of breaking the covenant. Can you repeat that, Charlene? Um, do you want me to back up to the very beginning? No, no, I just put the lamb. Oh, oh, so when, when Adam and Eve died, um, sinned, then they needed to have a blood covering for their sin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so personally, I can just see their creator saying, you know what, now we've got a problem because you've broken the covenant and it's obey and live, obey the covenant and live and disobey and die. So in order for plan B, I'm not going to execute that death penalty right now. We're going to go to plan B and we're going to offer a lamb, whatever, an animal with blood that will cover this problem until the Messiah comes and his blood covers it all because his is the better. Yeah, yeah. And so for me, I would see that as the very first Passover, very first Passover and Passover lamb. And that would have been handed down all through those generations, all the way to Noah. Go ahead, Tim. And I think a very interesting question when we get to ask Yahusha face to face, was that on a B14? That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Do you think then they sinned on the 14th <laughs> <laughs> of the first month? Yeah. Well, you know, you know, there's some Maybe. interesting patterns in the in the scriptures. Because Yahushua died on that day. If he would have died the day before, the day after, or a week later, it wouldn't have been the right date. But that was set down from the foundation of the world. And so the way I like to look at it is at the, at the scene of the crime, that's where the investigation has to be made. And the investigation, that's, it's on that day. So there's a reason for everything. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So when um, yeah, when when Moses like it's not it's not recorded um until Moses um had that um uh, huge exodus out of Egypt, but that's an interesting point too, because the the, uh, the Hebrew nation, you know, from Adam all the way up up to um the, the Egyptian scenario there. Um, they knew these things. They kept them. You know, that's why we have um, Abraham, where it says that he obeyed my statutes and my laws. But when Moses brought those out of Egypt, this was a great multitude of Egyptians that didn't know this creator, didn't know these covenants. That's where it was written down. And a lot of the Hebrews that had been under bondage of slavery for quite a long time and perhaps forgot or could not keep these appointments because of the bondage and the slavery from the Pharaoh, then it, then it needed to be written down. That was when it was written down, but it was passed down from generation to generation by word of mouth would have been, but it didn't have to be written down because they all kept it. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Well, I, I don't have any questions about the presentation because it's um, very clear and a bit ridiculous, if you ask, <laughs> that we have to. <laughs> we have to present that <laughs> so people can understand. Yes, we do have to yeah, present It's a bit that. sad. It's a bit sad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. I would 
I I would like to if you if it's okay with you, I would like to show off and um read the Greek word that you could. Mm, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> because that's what I do. I read Greek. So, Enea ke dekaetiris. <laughs> which is which is a weird word we do not use it of course now nowadays but uh, so nine and ten years that's what um it means enea ke deca etiris enea is nine k is end deca is ten etiris is from etos etos is a year so thank you yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was my moment of showing off. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thank you for understanding. And uh, I have um, um, an irrelevant question to the presentation, but irrelevant to Noah's flood, which I never had the, the opportunity to ask anybody. I will ask you your opinions. Um, you know that there are people out there that they believe that the flood was not um, worldwide, that it was a local uh, flood. There are people who believe that. So one of their arguments is that uh, then how did um, the, the salinity of the waters would be completely um, um, interrupted and, you know, um, spo uh, spoiled com completely. And there are fish uh, that live in uh, salty waters and there are fish that live in uh, sweet waters, you know, in rivers and uh, lakes. So the a worldwide flood would completely destroy the waters and all the, all the sea life and... Um, uh, water life would be completely destroyed. <clears throat> so how do we have so rich water life today? What's your opinion on that? I mean, how would you respond to that? That all water life was completely destroyed during the flood, a worldwide flood? Personally, I do not understand how he did this. I I have no explanation for it. I don't believe that they were everything on the sea was destroyed. It doesn't say that in scripture. So I, I don't have an explanation, to be very honest. It does say that all life was destroyed. That stand on the earth. Mm -hmm. It says on the earth, on the yes. land. Yes, that stand on the earth. So it clarifies that. Yes. Ah, it's interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So I, I not that's that's the base the basis I guess that I have that I do not believe that the sea life was destroyed, not all of it maybe maybe some of it I I don't know, but all that stood on hard ground was destroyed. Period. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, that that people don't understand from cover to cover in the scriptures is that that first time was a cleansing of water and the second time the earth will be cleansed with fire and it isn't going to be just part of the earth you know mm. so, so those are patterns too that we need to remember and we need to also remember we can trust the scriptures what they say we need to learn to trust what they say and sometimes we have to put the puzzle pieces together to figure out what's the in between the lines but yeah there's if if you want to have a hook of doubt there's lots there Mm -hmm. Kim, are you trying to find the passage? Um, I was just thinking about, yeah, it said all flesh died. The creeping on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming that swarm on the earth and all mankind it does not right. say that in the water. And so my, I'm just thinking I went back to Genesis on day five then. Um, it's interesting because man and beast were created on the sixth day. Mm -hmm. The fish and the birds mm -hmm. were on the um, fifth yeah. day. Mm -hmm. And maybe I was just looking at the wording. The waters will teem with living beings. High. Life. Um, so... Uh, I just, my head is thinking about something. That else. means that also the birds survived. I don't know, though, because they wouldn't. The, the birds, 
because they're not mentioned uh, they're not mentioned uh, on that um you know uh, the the flesh part that will be destroyed it didn't save also the the ones who fly well noah had ravens and doves on the ark and yeah. i don't think the birds would have survived if there was everything was covered and there was no <clears throat> so you think they were in the ark mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. there's lots more to this Noah's uh, flood account than just counting these days um, there's a way a lot more about the, the dove and the raven we haven't gone into that because we're just kind of focusing on calendar but we will bring out in the review that we do for the Passover review of what is happening between Noah's second year in the second month and the 27th day. So we're going to save that. That's going to be a surprise for the review, which we're planning to do next time, and uh, how it relates to Yahusha and his Omer count. That's really interesting. So there is a little bit more. Even though there's 10 calendar clues in this flood account, we're just going to zero in on that one. Maria, can oh. I read a verse to you? Yes, yes. I want. Yes, and I think it might be the same verse that Tim read, uh, Genesis seven twenty four, and this is from the Interlinear Scriptural Analyzer, Genesis seven verse twenty four. Thus he wiped out everyone, risen on the face or on the surface of the ground, from human unto beast, unto creeper and unto flyer of the heavens. They were okay. wiped. They were wiped off the earth. Only Noah remained, and those with him in the ark. Okay. So the birds are mentioned. Um, the... Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, Noah had a dove and a raven on his ark, and mm -hmm. how things multiplied after that, I don't know. <laughs> oh. Uh, uh... Genetically speaking, it's very easy to get um, all yep. the um, the species that we have uh, today from, uh, you know, these um, original ones. All the variety of uh, different kinds that we have yes. today. I have seen very that easy, and very fast. Yeah, I have seen that displayed on the on the view of dogs. All the different variations of dogs. exactly. We're doing yeah. it today with dog uh, breeding yeah. and cat breeding mm -hmm. breedings. Yeah. Yeah, activate, activating different chromosomes and things like that. Yeah, they're uh, they're eliminating um, chromosomes. No, they're not eliminating chromosomes. They're eliminating um, information yeah. from uh, from uh, the DNA expression, yeah. and they do it very fast. They do it within. I may be wrong, but it's no more than seven seven generations. That characteristic that they want to eliminate, it's eliminated. They never get it back. Never. Yeah. So, so they're damming down basically uh, DNA by yeah. by this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The original uh, kinds they they had a much much richer um, information. Um, yeah, they had a richer expression of information in uh, their DNA mm -hmm. than what we have today. That's why yeah. we look we look back at the original or the patriarchs. And they must have been very, very, very intelligent people because mm -hmm. we have deteriorated over time. Yes. And, we think and we're trying some, to understand. Yeah. We think that we're somebody small little and we're, brains. <laughs> yeah. We think we're somebody and we, we're smart here. I uh, know. Yes, yes. And so, we can figure out everything on our own. You look at those patriarchs, they were taught by angels. You know, what do we got? A computer. All <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, anything else relevant to um, today's um, topic before we no, I'm stop good. the recording? I'm good. Do we have any idea what we're doing uh, next time that we can announce? Mm -hmm. Yes, we're planning to do the review for your original question. What about the placement of Passover? <laughs> I think it's time. I think you should yeah. know your the answer to okay. your question. So what we want to do is review 
I don't know how long it's going to be, but just a review of everything we've kind of done, you know, on a, a smaller scale. And uh, I'll have the links there for the people if they want to see the studies. Yeah, we'll do a review. Right. And you're going to give us that um, uh, surprise information about NOS uh, flood? Mm -hmm. On a on a short scale, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. So I think we'll have fun. I think it'll be really fun to do it. And then everybody should know how to count Passover after that. And that it doesn't land always on a Tuesday or always on a Wednesday or always on a Thursday or any other day of the week. It's always on the 14th day of the first month. Yeah. Mm -hmm.